We're going to go and visit that island just over there and investigate a completely toxic tide pool full of very, very toxic palifoa. Not that island over there, because that channel is full of great white sharks. But first, we're going to go and get George. We're going to hide through a little bit of the water. We're going to visit the land of Mordor. And then on the way home, we might collect some very special cleanup crew for Palau Reef. You're watching The Australian Aquarist. Now, I said it before and I'll say it again. It's great to have a companion with you on your expeditions. Better off human, but if not, a dog like George, German wirehead pointer, is a fantastic companion. If not one that's ever so slightly large. And tends to make people very scared. Check this out. These rocks are absolutely amazing. They're beautiful. They're sort of like a, a volcanic rock. I don't know if it's a basalt or, or what, it, what it is, but the, the way they've eroded and fished it over the time has reminded me very much of my freshwater roots, and that is in a lot of the aquascaping design and techniques of Takashi Amano. It's actually given rise to a couple of aquariums, some saltwater aquariums that I've done back in my fish shed, in particular my old wife and Kalerpa filiformis tank. Does this look familiar? That's right, that tank, the rock in that tank come from this location right here. And does this look familiar? Yep, that's my green moray tank and the rock for that one came from just here. So no matter where you are in the world, there's inspiration all around you. Just get out and take a look. This rock, this rock here, I absolutely love. And I would dearly love to be able to bring this one home. There's no way in the world I'm gonna be able to lift this rock. I love it, love it. Come on, George, let's go. This rock pool looks just like any other rock pool. But underneath the water of this rock pool is an absolute sea of zoanthids and palifoa, which I find really, really interesting because it's absolutely isolated from any other rock pool in the area. And not only that, the ocean itself is another two or three metres down on the eastern side of this island. The conditions here must be absolutely crazy. Now if you think about it on a hot summer's day which is 30 degrees Celsius, all these rocks surrounding us here must be absorbing all that heat and then bouncing all that heat straight into this isolated body of water. Only on high swells does the water actually get up and over that rock face there and introduce fresh water or fresh salt water into this tide pool. Very rarely do I see a lot of fish. I'm, I just think that potentially on a hot summer's day, when this is so hot and potentially the palifoa are stressed and they're releasing their toxin, then any, any chance of fish life would actually be fairly slim. Right up underneath the shade here, right up you get the palifoa deep emerald green. Now these guys are really easy to keep in aquariums and they're actually really attractive. They actually fluoresce very brightly. Look at this. It's absolutely chockers with pallies over here. Absolutely chockers. Look at the colour of these ones. The danger with them is that palithoa had the ability to produce palitoxin. And palitoxin is the second most toxic biological compound known to man. Now, I didn't know what the first most toxic compound was, so I had to go and jump on good old Google, and I discovered it's called metotoxin, which is actually produced by dinoflagellate. The symptoms of palitoxin poisoning are similar to a flu-like symptom, whereby, ooh, there's a little tube worm. There it is, it's pretty cool. Aches and fevers, very, very sick. And I believe in some cases you can actually die. I have found some corals. I'm gonna jump on in and I'm gonna show you some of the corals that you're gonna find living amongst a toxic type pool with palithoa. Just checking to make sure it's stony. Yep, it's stony, which means that this is a turban area. 
Actually looks very similar to a Saka fight in many cases. It actually amazes me that there's this very old Montipora colony, which I think it's a Montipora, living in these harsh conditions. Now I do know that over this side here, underneath the shade of this boulder, we've also got some more stony corals. Can't see how large the polyps are growing on the south side of this boulder, which makes me think that it could be a Cyphastria. A little bit more brown and green Montipora all the way around, all the way around, all the way around. So Cladiella is a really common branching soft coral. It usually comes in this kind of brown color, except that when you actually touch it and it closes up, it shows some of its paler actual stalks and the fuzzy brown kind of polyps tend to attract, giving that sort of two-tone cookies and cream appearance. In my memory that somewhere in here is actually a Micromusa Lord Howensis, a Lord, what some people will call an Acan. Ooh, it's still alive. It's still alive, but only just. It's actually mostly out of the water. It might just be sand covering it. You can see that we do have some life in this Micromusa. Looks like we've got a little bit of an orange polyp just in there. And I don't, this coral's not dead. This coral is definitely not dead. It's just waiting for a bit more water to return to this rock pool. Who knows how long it's going to be before we get some more water into this rock pool, hey George? Now most people don't want these snails in their reef tank. And the reason being is they actually love to climb up out of the actual water, sit themselves up on the bracing or the glass straps of the aquarium, and in many cases, they'll end up all over the floor and die. But the reason I want these snails in my reef tank is my reef tank is not actually a tank, it's a paludarium. But there's been one little hiccup in a saltwater plywood aquarium, and that is the inability to scrape the back wall, the painted wall, with a razor to remove stubborn algae. So I can do that quite readily, obviously, on the glass front and the two glass ends. But for the back of the aquarium, I've been reliant on a scrubbing brush and a cloth pad to try and keep it clean. And so what I did, I actually collected some black rock pool snails. Again, I'm not sure of the species. And I actually uh, included them in the stocking of Palau Reef. And the results, I might say, have been quite encouraging. Check this out. So you will notice that the snails are sitting up out of the water. There's that dark one there, sorry about the blue lights. You can see a cluster up at the back there. And if I can go very, very close without getting my phone wet, there's a cluster up underneath the island itself there. Up under the island there couple on the glass and over in the back corner past the archer fish there's a little group clustered up in there so they're doing what they do but during the actual night time they're actually done a really really good job they've actually come down the back timber wall of my aquarium where I had to scrub it by hand and couldn't use a razor blade and they've actually cleaned almost a one foot band all the way across the top, completely clean of the algae, which then has allowed that decorative um, uh, sea foaming painted job that I did with the polyurethane paint, the aqua coat, to actually shine through again, which is actually making me feel pretty happy. And the other thing that I really do like is the idea of actually having a display. I like the idea of having a display. A display that actually incorporates a couple of different types of animals in a couple of different types of environment. And the idea of having some snails that actually habitate this, uh, this island area is actually pretty exciting for me. I'm actually thinking, I'm actually thinking it'd be cool. I'll, I'll, I'll put these snails in and I'll just see how they go for a while, obviously. I'm not going to push things. But how cool would it be to have some Asian shore crabs scuttling around the actual folk rock work, popping up into the plants there, and uh, maybe coming down for a drink and a, and a feed of some frenzy fish feed pellets. Little plug there for the sponsor. I reckon that'd be awesome. We'll see how these snails go. I'll report back. But if you've got a setup similar to mine with a low water level, 
or maybe some exposed uh, driftwood or rockwork or a saltwater paludarium, then I'm thinking that these intertidal snails, which I might add, are used to the extremes of temperature that do occur in a tide pool. So even if you are from a temperate area, I guarantee you that those tide pools, those rock pool waters are gonna be getting up there during the daytime and match more appropriately what we're keeping our uh, tropical coral reef tanks at. Have a think about it, give it a crack. For now, I'm wet, I'm cold, it's time for a shower. I'll see you next time in Australian Aquarist.